1957, famed boat designer Sandy Douglas designed a brand new 19-foot, 850-pound boat that would go on to be one of the best one-design sailboats in the history of boat building. Coming off the 17-foot triumph of Thistles in a 20-foot Highlander, the Flying Scott was born. Inside Great Lakes Sailing gets a chance to spend some time with the current owners and builders of Flying Scott sailboats, Tyler and Carrie Andrews. We're going to talk about the boat, its history, a little bit about Sandy Douglas, and exactly what's going to happen here in Western Lake Erie and Lake St. Clair with all the activities of Flying Scott Sailing. My name is Greg Norman, your host. We'll be back in just a second. Welcome back to another edition of Inside Great Lakes Sailing. My name is Greg Norman, your host. We are lucky enough to have with us today the owners and builders of Flying Scots. We're going to talk all kinds of those. They're Tyler and Carrie Andrews. First of all, welcome. Well, to the show, and we're coming aboard and spending some time with us, and I appreciate the, the your time. Our pleasure. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Are you guys in Maryland? Am I correct? Yep. So Western, Western Maryland. Western Maryland. Uh, yep. Maryland just won yesterday. Won the NCAA uh, lacrosse championships. There's been some banter about lacrosse through the the process. <laughs> They completed an 18 and 0 season and considered one of the one of the top three teams that's ever played the game at the collegiate level. So. Good, good for the uh, for the Terrapins. The reason we're talking is, uh, Tyler, you're coming to uh, Crescent Sail Yacht Club uh, the yep. weekend of 11th and 12th for the, I believe, the Michigan and Ontario districts. Yes, you yep. So let me ask a couple of simple questions to start with. There's about 120 or so fleets, which is, I think, one of the bigger fleets uh, in terms of one designs in the country. You're coming. Yep. How busy are you sailing as compared to building boats as a company? I would love to get to sail more. Uh, we Our goal before we had kids was to try to make it to one regatta a month. Um, but it doesn't work out like that once you have three kids. So midwinters and nationals every year are a must. At midwinters this last winter, I was over early four out of seven races, which <laughs> – uh, I'm not bragging about. But if you want a story, there's one. That's uh, how do you do that? Four out of seven. You got to hit the majority of it. But so um, it was. Just, I hadn't sailed the boat since nationals the year before. Just with uh, we just had a baby in December, and um, Carrie had a baby in December, <laughs> um, and uh, so we're very blessed. And, and hopefully, as the kids get older, we'll be able to start hitting our regatta a month goal with the kids on board it's a great boat to sail with your kids and uh, william and caleb our older boys are they're four and five are getting close i think we're just wow. in that stage right now where we're trying we're trying to build demand with them so we're not we're not throwing them into it we're, we're making them want it not yet not yet and then and then when they finally get to do it they'll, they'll never stop wanting to do it we're going to talk about his, the history of the of the Flying Scott, but Sandy Douglas, the designer, also designed thistles. Crescent's has a couple of thistle races, plus later in the year, I believe, North Cape. Talk a little bit about the North Cape Flying Scott. And my, my point to this is that uh, Sandy Douglas's boats are being highlighted, at least this year, in, Saint, in Lake St. Clair quite a bit. Yeah, um, up there in, in the Michigan area. Our Michigan fleets are really going off right now. We're seeing a lot of growth in Michigan. Um, Sandy Douglas designed the boat. We are actually Gordon Douglas Boat Company doing business as Flying Scott Incorporated. So 
we're the original company, uh, which is cool, especially for me having grown up sailing all of his designs, the Thistle and the Highlander, and now to get to build Flying Scots is a real honor. Uh, so Michigan in general is going off. Um, you know, you, you mentioned uh, Dwayne, I think, has helped a lot with this North Cape regatta, uh, North Cape Nationals. I think he's the one that has put his hat. What's his last name again? We're going. We're going. Yep. I think he he put he put the the hat uh, the, the name in the hat and I grew up sailing in North Cape. I love the venue, absolutely love it with the beach and and the weather. You know, versatile conditions. Um, I just can't wait to be back. So, as far as the Sandy Douglas design thing now, Scotts were actually built in Toledo for a while by Custom Flex. So a lot of the the, the Michigan fleets are. You know, historically custom flex boats, but like I said, we're getting a lot of orders from Michigan right now, and of course, those are going to be Flying Scott Incorporated boats, new Flying Scott Incorporated boats. Which once we get a new boat on the lake, they tend to grow like rabbits. So Michigan's went off Orchard Lake Country Club there in Detroit has six boats now. They just the last couple of years have, have been building a Flying Scott fleet, and they're looking to get two more this winter. So we'll have eight boats racing just up in Farmington Hills uh, on Orchard Lake out of the country club. Um, so yeah, Michigan okay. is big for Flying Scots. We were, you mentioned Dwayne, Dwayne Bergone is a former uh, Commodore at North Cape Yacht Club down in LaSalle. And I, I just want to mention that point. Carrie, take us, let's, before we get into the, the actual history of the boat, let's kind of take us through, you guys met in 2003 sailing. And kind of take us through the the process of marriage, and then how do we end up with owning the Flying Scott Boat Company? So it's actually there's kind of this running joke um, in our family that instead of Flying Scott, it should just be called the Love Boat because my parents met sailing Flying Scots. Okay. Um, so that's my father um, grew up in in Pittsburgh, Harry Carpenter, who. Um, anybody that's been around Flying Scots at all knows knows that name. <laughs> um, he grew up in Pittsburgh, and his family, um, my grandparents, built a little lake house down here on Deep Creek Lake. And my dad watched sailboats out, um, and and somebody was kind enough to take him for a ride. He got absolutely hooked, and um, it was his passion. He and his brother, my uncle, spent their days just reading anything they could at the library. And, and my grandfather was kind enough to buy them a boat, even though he had no idea about sailing or anything about it because he saw their passion and um, they grew up doing it. And um, so my dad started, you know, he started working for the company just in the summers, getting sailing lessons. Um, and then he told my grandparents, um, I, this is what I want to do. And so, uh, after he graduated college, he moved here and started in the factory, then moved into the office. Um, and, uh, he started, started there and started going on the national, he sailed a lot of nationals. He's a three time national champion. Um, and so he, he was making the regatta rounds. My mother, um, she was in Philadelphia area and she was crewing, um, one of the doctors that she worked for, she was a nurse. She crewed for him as their third group. They were at a regatta in um, Virginia at uh, Visa, Virginia Inland Lake Sailing Association. And my dad capsized. It was windy. It was the only time he's ever capsized in a race. Um, and my mother was there. And she brought him some hot chocolates. It was very cool. <laughs> and that started their long distance romance. And so um, fast forward, my mom moved here to Deep Creek. They, she started working at the company with my father. They bought it in 1990 from Eric Amon, who was one of Sandy Douglas's original um, partners. And he owned it after Sandy. And um, so then they, they ran it. Um, they had me and my brother. And I started racing with my father when I was about four. And so I got bit by the bugs. And um, did a few other things. I am a CPA as well. And so I went into the world of public accounting and did a few other things. Um, had to go out on my own a little bit. But um, the passion for sailing and for this company um, stayed with me. And so then when my parents were ready to, to talk about taking a step back, um, luckily I had met somebody who likes sailing as much as I do, which I wasn't really thinking was going to happen. And so Tyler agreed to move back with me and, uh, and we started there, but yeah, we, my dad was actually out crewing for me at our Midwest districts in Indianapolis. I was living there at the time, um, with the CPA job and, uh, 
Tyler just happened to be there giving a sailing lesson. And so we met, and then our joke is that he also met my parents on the very first date. And so we got all that out of the way. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, so that's, that's how we all, uh, all ended up meeting and sailing. <laughs> Jerry, first to ask the question to you is that since this obviously was a family business, you pretty much knew this was a love when you were at an early age that you wanted to yes. stay in this business. Yes. Yeah. I'm assuming that the CPA business background is to get, you got to still run a business, right? You got to know the numbers. That's right. Yeah. My, my father was an accounting major um, when he went to, to college. And so, um, yeah, I just kind of thought it would always be a good, um, you know, the, 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 the boating industry is, is a bit fickle <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, so I think it's always good to just kind of have something steady um, that, uh, that you can use. And so I just chose to be an accounting major, but yeah, it's, it's always kind of been that thing. I've helped my dad from a young age, went on delivery trips with him and delivered boats with him, sailed with him. And so it's definitely just, just ingrained. <laughs> Tyler, you have a meteorological degree. Did you ever think a, that you're going to get into the business of sailboats and in the business of sailboats? And the follow-up is you're the second. And I said this to you earlier, you're the second person we've had a chance to interview that has a meteorological degree, Peter Eisler being the other. So does that degree give you a chance to be maybe a little better on wind and ideas and thoughts than maybe the next guy who doesn't have a degree? Well, that was the idea when I chose that as a major. <laughs> I was actually, yeah, I wanted to be in the sailing industry while I was studying to be a meteorologist. I was also running a little sail loft that some friends and I from Indianapolis Jason Hubbard and Barrett Road started back in the day um, called Naptown Sales. So I was studying by day and sewing sales together at night. The meteorology degree was, was just going to help facilitate sailing, help me understand things better on the race course, because that's where I always wanted to be. You have three children, and we'll get to the, to the boat in just a second, but you have three children. I'm guessing since you, it's sort of third generation. I was a ski coach and a ski racer. My son now ski races and coaches, so it's Sometimes it stays in the family. Do you see that happening? Is as, uh, as you mentioned, you're going to put some at some point put all five of you on a, on a flying Scott. Absolutely, yeah. Our our uh, boys definitely seem to have bitten been bitten by the bug. Uh, we try hard not to um, you know make them go, but anytime they ask, we we take them. And uh, actually, it was a really cool this weekend. We just got out my son fish, which my father got me when I was four. It was my first sailboat. And um, she came back out for our, our five-year-old um, and he lovingly washed it and got it all ready. And he and his dad, even though there wasn't much wind, they went out and he was ecstatic. So yes, it does seem like uh, the love for sailing is going to continue. <laughs> how, long, how long have you been in charge of the company at this point? We have now been in charge for seven years. Seven, wow. Time flying. Yeah. <laughs> so let me... Let me take you back because I want to do a little history on the boat so everybody has a really clear understanding of, of the boat and, and its history. You go back to 57. Um, obviously, Sandy um, Douglas had built the Thistles. He would built the Highlander. And he kind of got from everything I've read, he kind of got the idea he wanted to build a simpler boat, one that was maybe not quite as fast. Not necessarily as fast, but much simpler to ride, maybe a, more of a, a mass market boat. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, absolutely. The, the Flying Scott was designed to be a, a production boat. You know, the Thistle and the Highlander, um, you know, they're, just the way that they're put together um, is not as production line friendly, if you will, as the, as the Flying Scott. Um, so you take, a, you take a 17 foot Thistle, you take a 20 foot Highlander. Now you've got 19 feet. So maybe explain what his thoughts were. How do you, how do you come up with 19 feet and, and maybe talk a little bit about the history of the boat itself? Knowing Sandy, he probably knew that was the average size of a garage in America. There was some reason, <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, I, I didn't know him, but I, I read his book, and so I, I feel like I, I know him. I've also gotten to hear Carrie's dad tell Sandy stories and a lot of other Flying Scott sailors who knew him over the years. So I'm sure that there was a reason, but I don't know what – I don't know the, I don't know the reason on that one. Uh, you can try me on something else. I might know the reason, but not on that one. Yeah, now, are you did. still – go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, he he really wanted it to be. I tell people all the time, you know, when we're at boat shows talking about the boat, that his passion was he wanted it to be a boat that was easy to rig and sail. So he purposely made it very simple, you know, with the way that it comes together. He envisioned, you know, couples or families being able to go sailing and not have to spend hours, you know, putting a boat together. He saw that as a, you know, as a barrier. 
for people that just want to be able to go sailing simply and not have a lot of a lot of there's, tweaking involved. <laughs> there's a couple of lines uh, from some college sailing coaches over the last few years. What they loved about the most was that it's simple to rig. There's not a lot you can do to it. And if you're going to use it as a racing boat, it really comes down to tactics and, and ability and understanding what it is, which may not be necessarily true in some of those other classes where the smallest, you know, micrometer adjustment maybe gives you a chance to go faster. And yeah, we, we say all the time that it's a boat that's very, it's a very easy to sail boat. So it's very, very, very popular with camps, sailing programs. But when you get to that upper echelon, she's a boat that is difficult to sail very, very, very well. So those nuances, like you said, tend to come into play. So she's a boat that I think she's unique in that she stays with people. You know, they, they get it on an entry level, but then as their skills progress, you can continue to kind of dial it in and fine tune it and reach new, newer and newer levels. Um, you know, so that the boat grows with you, which a lot of times with boats, you kind of grow out of them, or you go to another thing. So she kind of runs that spectrum. Is a boat built in 2022 pretty close to the same boat that was built in 1960? Absolutely. We're building out of the same, um, the same master mold. So they're, they're as identical as they can possibly be. <laughs> does, that make, product. <laughs> does that make handicapping pretty easy for one design? I mean, there is no handicap and they're, they're the same. You're not going to find an advantage uh, as long as you have a good boat, you know, which um, they all are. I mean, so the new ones, I mean, you know, um, the newer, the better, just so you don't have to replace parts and everything. You know, the slowest boat is the one that's broken down so that's <laughs> that's one of the nice things about a new boat and this boat was a is a balsa core with a with a fiberglass base right am i correct that's correct yep. i was i guess i was referring to handicaps again one of the things that happens is not knowing a lot of racing background sometimes i will ask a stupid question and that's not a stupid question but no no and that's my point is that I, that's why we're trying to understand it so if i take the flying scott out into a, a another not a there, yeah. there is handicaps at that point, correct? Oh yeah, she, and she, yeah. So she does have a, a favorable. Maybe I don't, maybe I shouldn't say this on national <laughs> television. She's got a favorable perf rating, very favorable. So you would do well in your PHRF fleet with a Flying Scott. The people that seem to sail them, at least at our club, where you're going to be here in, I guess, a couple of weeks, um, they're just like every fleet, if you own a 33 Hobie, you love your 33 Hobie. But my point, the Flying Scott people seem to be a little more voracious about their <laughs> love for their boat. You find that across the country? Absolutely. We always say that we're so blessed because, um, yeah, we, you know, we do advertising, we do boat shows, but really what sells Flying Scots are the Flying Scott owners that are just passionate about the boat. And um, if they're such a great group of people. We get feedback all the time from people that are coming into the fleet, um, especially that have sailed other classes and their, their overwhelmingly consistent comment is, Flying Scott sailors are so friendly and they're so passionate about getting everybody up to the same level um, so everybody can compete together. And so there's none of this, you know, secret keeping, things like that. And so, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely across the board. 1998, the Flying Scott was inducted into the American Sailboat Hall of Fame. While I was looking it up, I thought, wow, this is pretty cool. And then I looked down about three quarters of the way, and they've actually got a 24 or 26 foot McGregor as part of that Hall of Fame. And I'm thinking, when I lived in California, McGregor's were built across the street. Not exactly a quality sailboat. I'm not suggesting <laughs> that the American Hall of Fame isn't a great, a great deal, but it is uh, certainly an honor for the boat. And if you look down the list of those boats in that, I think there are 34 of them. A lot of them are very revolutionary to what they were doing. <laughs> Time. And I think that's probably is that is that fair. And you can water ski with this. You can put a sixty horsepower motor on the McGregor. So I mean, <laughs> they did have that, which nobody else has managed to do. You can do it all with the McGregor. Um, I mean, except for sail. But if you didn't know that you couldn't sail it well, you would think that you could sail it. Well. It does have a mass, has a mainsail. It's just really, really heavy and does not sail well. I'm hoping but, they're. I'm hoping they're, they're. I'm hoping their quality for McGregor for the Hall of Fame was that. They were the first water ballast boat ever built yeah. the way it was built. Oh, that too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that was the secret sauce that got them in, not necessarily their sailing capabilities. <laughs> yeah, the Scott, yeah, she was she was the first one to um, you know, be be fiberglass from day one. 
Um, you know, and so that's where like, against like thistles and Highlander and stuff as a builder, we are able to be much more consistent because we didn't have to jump mediums from being a wood boat to a fiberglass boat. Right. So, how do you end up, how do you up in, Mar in Western Maryland? How does that, where, where does that come from? Just luck? That was actually Sandy. Um, so he built the first year, at, well, he was out in Ohio. Um, and then he got a little bit uh, ticked off at the state of Ohio. Um, they wanted to build, expand the highway and uh, eminent domain. And so he got really, Sandy had a little bit of a fiery temper from what I understand. And so he got mad and uh, he had a buddy that lived out here and said, hey, you need to come out here. There's really quality um, craftsmen and it's it's cheap, um, cheap living, cheap, cheap, uh, cheap production costs uh, is kind of in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and so he did. And uh, they packed up the molds and moved. And they actually downtown Oakland, uh, their first location was a car dealership. And uh, and and then they that wasn't working out so great because there was a beauty salon next door. And uh, the ladies getting their hair done did not appreciate the smell of styrene. Um, so they eventually built the facility that we're in now um, and moved out here where the, this building was built for Flying Scott production. So it's uh, very, very user friendly <laughs> and did lots of space around it. <laughs> did Tanzer not build some early boats for you guys? Tanzer? Yes, we yeah, did build some. Mm -hmm. How many, how many Flying Scots have been built in, the, in this history? Well, we're, we stay pretty consistent on our numbers. We don't jump big, uh, big. So what you're seeing out there is really what's about out there. So we are just getting uh, to the 62, 60s, 62, 60s. Just about. I mean, we haven't actually started building 62, 60s yet, but I think uh, this fall we'll, we'll get to the 62, 60s. The way it works is we get 30 numbers at a time kind of from the class. So you can pick your number within those 30 you get lucky you got 30 to choose from if not then you just have the last number available from that batch before we'll get another 30 sale numbers to dish out so right now we're building between 6230 and 6260 okay um your boats are about what Fifteen thousand the base model coming out the door sound about right <laughs> 325 is okay. sorry, 30, 335 uh with sales and trailer okay i'm obviously not even close to being did, were you guessing or where did no, you No, I, I, I didn't know. I, saw, I thought I'd saw something. That's why I was asking. So obviously yeah. I was looking at an old advertisement from 1970 when Nixon was president. So <laughs> we'll, cover, we'll cover my mistake that way. It would have been a good investment back then, and it still is today. We actually hold our value incredibly well. I mean, you're kind of seeing it with cars and everything right now, but the Flying Scots have always – if you bought a, a 1972 Flying Scott for – $3,500, then you can certainly sell it for $3,500 today. And if you buy a 2000 and if that holds true, like it has over the last 63, 64 years, then if you buy a Scott today for 33.5 with sales and trailer, then, you know, in uh, 2056, you can probably get your 32.5 out. <laughs> Is the simplicity of the boat part of the reason it retains its value? Yeah. I think so. You know, you see a lot of boats that, um, you know, there's no backstay. There's, you know, a lot of things that fatigue boats, um, you know, just aren't, aren't there. And, um, you know, so yeah, you see boats that just, they're multi-generational boats, you know, they last through, um, you know, plus they're built, you know, a lot of people would say we, we overbuild them. Um, but you know, that's, that's, that's part of the beauty of it, but yes, definitely. I think the simplicity helps for sure. Okay, so just maybe explain that as a boat builder. When you say you overbuild it, when you're building something, this is a conversation I had with, with, with Harry Melgus last year, is that the quality control in your business, and probably automobiles, not to suggest that other businesses don't have quality control, but that's the, you want to hold value because from a business model, 20 years from now, it, it's, it's, you're not selling millions of, of product, so a lot of your success becomes word of mouth. Is that is that fair? Yeah, we've we've hit um, we we have we've hit that 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 point where we kind of self the class is is um, speeding us leads and 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 giving us referrals. So many people love the boat that we've hit that um, that number where it, it it helps us to market. And yeah, we just build a, a really good product. Our business model is not to replace ourselves, which is it has you know so if you have a 1957 flying scott and you need a four-stay extension 
then give us a call. We'll send you a 1957 Forest Day extension. There's not a lot of boats like that where, you know, you typically if, if you're buying and my sister's going through this right now, she's looking for a boat for her son and uh, they're on the West Coast and not enough time to get a flying Scott out there to them. They also want a 14 footer. So I'm looking at this boat is called a Scorpion, but they're not manufactured anymore. So the problem is if she breaks something that is custom to that boat, how are you going to replace that part? And that's, that's been a lot of our, our success is, is um, we've hit that critical mass number. And, and so we, all we have to do now is just take care of our customers and everything else will take care of itself. Carrie, how much of your business is parts versus and percentage wise as compared to new sales? Um, it's, it's still the, definitely the new boats are still what, you know, what drives the business. Um, you know, my, my dad taught me that and uh, it still holds true today. Um, but our parts are a, are a large percentage. So they certainly, um, help fill the gaps. Um, but they're, they're very consistent, you know, so even if we have a lower year on new boat production, the parts tend to continue to kind of just stay, stay nice and steady. So we have a, we're very blessed. My dad had the foresight to put together an entire online store, which you don't see a lot with small one design, you know, boats. Um, so our parts store is very accessible to people. Um, and Tyler's done a great job getting our, keeping us, uh, I'm not technologically advanced at all, but he does the, you know, keeping us up on Google and stuff. So when people do need things, we pop up, our store pops up. Um, and so we've been, we work really hard um, right now, especially in today's environment to keep that part store stocked. But, um, but it definitely is a huge part of, of what keeps us going. You can often tell a quality of a company by the employees that work for it. You've got a guy on your staff for more than 40 years named Dom Sharpless. Is that, yes, am I correct? Mm -hmm. He's yeah. your foreman. So he's got to be the first guy that's got to be the quality control hat. I'm assuming he's the first guy that wears that hat. Not that you don't, but talk a little bit about Don because he's been with, with the company for 40 years. And I mean, that's got to mean something to you guys. I love Don. Um, I've, I've had a, a a few gigs over the years. Uh, I was a manager at a Walmart for a while, uh, ran some sailing programs, and Don's one of my favorite people all time to work with. He's just always got a smile on, always very helpful, and you're exactly right. You know, if, if we need to know something that was built a certain way in, in 19, you know, 80, 81, then we just got to go to Don and he has the answer. He, he built it that way then. Yeah. All right. Am I it's just on the rigging stuff. Like, so for the spinnaker, the spinnaker sheets, they used to be on deck. We can still do it that way. Some people still like it that way. A lot of people like them, you know, through deck. So th there's some rigging stuff that we can tap into Don's mind for. And, and just in training, you know, if somebody calls in and, Lo and behold, it's something that I haven't done myself before. I mean, if somebody calls in, then I put my my layup hat on and I'll go lay up a hole, which I enjoy every now and then. Um, but if I don't, if I've not been trained on that, then Don certainly has been over the course of the last 41 years. And he'll he'll he and I together will uh, make it happen. Just just for example. Last question on boat building. In the last five years, we've seen the economy jump all over the map. We've had the pandemic from a business perspective is the boat business in decent shape is it scratching for every nickel has it stayed consistent has it been all fluxed as the economy's been talk to that a little bit um because i've had it's been interesting talking to other boat builders and it really depends on their price points as to where they're where their own business the higher the point the more stable the business the lower the point obviously because most people that have money to buy big boats have money to buy big boats and that decision changes as you come down the the escalating ladder. So can you talk to that for a second, Carrie? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. So we've we kind of noticed, um, and my dad noticed this trend well before I did, but um, our, our business specifically definitely tends to follow the stock market. So um, we definitely see an uptick as the market does well. I think a lot of that comes, you know, and that's, that's what I always kind of say. I keep my CPA license active because when you're building a luxury product, you know, people have to make decisions about where their dollars are going. Right. You know, you're, you're, the sailboat is not going to make cut. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, we definitely have a have some volatility with that um, for sure. And you're absolutely right. Like the bigger boat guys are hitting a, a price point that, that those people can ride through that stuff, and it's not nearly as uh, 
as touchy. We are again back to your your question earlier about the parts business, um, you know, and we also have a repair shop, um, a full time repair shop, and so that does help. Um, you know, in, in a down economy where people may not be going new, but they're getting used boats and they still want to be able to fix them up and, and do things. Um, you know, we certainly have that avenue as well, but we are, we are very sensitive to it. Um, and so, you know, right now, um, we've been very blessed through, through the pandemic, actually, our order stayed very, very consistent, um, which, which had somebody asked me to, to bet that I would not have, I was, yeah, that's that the account in me is always uh, doing the very conservative, like, uh, um, so I, I really expected things to maybe slow down, um, but they haven't, we've been building, um, you know, 30 boats a year consistently for the, for the throughout. And, um, you know, we're, we're seeing that pace right now. Um, so we're, we're very, very blessed to, uh, to continue with that. But, um, but we're very right now, uh, materials prices, um, is something that we're, we're working with, um, our margins, you know, are not as, as, as big as probably the big boat, <laughs> big boat guys. So we're, we're trying to very carefully walk that line, but, um, Tyler, last couple questions. Um, you're coming to Crescent for the uh, districts here in, in town. What boat are you going to be on? And I'm just curious, who are you crewing with? So Bruce Lilly out of Orchard Lake. Uh, he's the sailing director over there. Really great guy. And uh, good, he's, we've become good friends. Uh, and so he's going to sail with me and we're going to use one of their new boats. He's going to bring it down so I can just, I'm actually going to deliver a boat on the way. So I can drive there empty and then use an Orchard Lake boat and drive away um, so I can and on to tow, which is nice. So you are a two-man crew. Yeah. Is this a three? Is that two? I know it says two to eight, but what's a what's a perfect crew in the boat? Two or three. Okay. Mostly two. Um, the, the venues have kind of gotten to the point now where it's, it used to be like at a midwinter's uh, in the Panhandle, it was always windy. And so people came, you know, three up. You never showed up to midwinter's without three but most most of the time now it's it's gone kind of gone to a two two person boat which i think is where it's real popular um you know couples boat you see a lot uh, we actually have a, a wife husband national championship that's all just married couples sailing against each other um so so it's it's very very popular two up boat and so that's where you see most that's of that's in texas this year in the fall so there's still time to get a boat and a wife <laughs> and Made for Rush Creek. We gotta get the wife first, though, right? Before the boat. I think that would make sense. Yeah, you 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 can get married on the way, but you gotta be married for the first. For the first does year. weight? Does a crew weight matter? And I say that before twenties. There's a. I mean, I I joke all the time with some of the kids that were in our program. I'm a perfect size two man crew for a four twenty because of my weight. Um, I weigh equal to what you know two two kids would weigh. Is there a weight factor in the boat that you want? There's too much weight when you're racing. I mean, between uh, not so much because you you will sail the boat differently though. I mean, um, Jeff Linton and Amy Linton, uh, they 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 whoop up on us at three hundred, which is pretty. You know, they're a little more than three hundred, maybe three twenty. Um, but uh, they don't always win, and so like last nationals, it was a light. We had two days of breeze in Westport, Connecticut, and two days of, like drifter. Two races, I mean, two races of breeze, two races of drifter, and um, the heavy team prevailed there. Uh, Dave Ames and, and PJ uh, Bueller, I believe is his last name. I'm sorry, PJ, if if I'm butchering that on the spot, but um, they were way they they probably weigh in at four something, you know. So um, the weight doesn't matter a lot. Now Dave and PJ were certainly not pointing the boat like. Jeff and Amy were vice versa. They'd be they bow down a little more, but uh, it, between so between right there we have between three hundred and and four fifty is a good it's a good range. I guess anything over five hundred as a married couple would probably not such great sailors, but great at the buffet. Anyway, <laughs> that's a bad joke. That's <laughs> you, I'll you cut that out. Agreed. <laughs> you know, I get it. I, I get it. And then I guess the last question: you see all kinds of sales and. You see black sails on bigger boats. You see all kinds of, are, are folks buying your boats? Are they as at the higher sailing levels, racing levels? Are they as persnickety about their sails as maybe uh, somebody that's not? Or is it is it the same kind of attempt? Yeah, about the, the, the sail, like the North sail. We use North sails and Mad sails. And you're talking about the design of the sails? No, I'm, they're actually material kinds of things. So the cost, 
you can pay anything from a little bit to a lot for sale. And is that when you buy a boat from you, could, do I have that op do I have that option? A little bit, but the class actually keeps that pretty clamped down. Um, so, so with the rules of the class, the sale, the parameters of, of which the sale has to fit and the materials that can be used kind of limit that. Um, okay. So the most kind of creative fun you can have is with your spinnaker um, and design, but really the sales are very, very consistent. She means the color design. You can pick your colors. Yes, your colors. That's, so that's I, about I as it, crazy as you I can get. <laughs> the, the 52 class, the, 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 the GPs or you know the, the transpac boats, they're real specific about what they can do within the class. There's not a lot of things you can do to change those boats. Yeah. Whether you have a 2004 boatine or a 2021, and that's that's kind of what I'm asking. So it, again, it narrows the the IROC part of car racing. It, it narrows it down to a point so that when everybody steps on the, in this case, glides onto the water, it's a it's a much even, much more even keel and fair, yeah. equitable race. Does that make yeah, sense? The class, yeah, yeah. The class actually has a has a rule in place where um, you know you can only buy a new suit of sale a year. Um, and that, that is exactly for that reason. They want to keep it so that, you know, it's not who spends the most that does the best. Um, and it really is, uh, kind of keeps the Corinthian spirit and you have people, um, coming out to sale that aren't getting discouraged because they don't either have the time or the budget to be constantly, um, you know, overhauling their boat. And so it, it really does make it a nice range of, um, range of people coming out. And it's interesting because if you travel within the Scott class and you go to the different regattas, um, you'll, you'll meet different people all along the way. A lot of classes, you know, it's kind of a very strong travel contingent. It's the same kind of group that moves. And with the Scott, it's not like that. You'll, you'll race against different people, um, all over the board on skill level and everything else. Um, and I think that, that the class keeping kind of a cap on that has really helped that. Cool. Last question. When do you two get to race to get with each other at some point this summer? Is that going to happen? Wife husbands. Yeah, yeah, we're hoping to get to the wife husbands. Um, and uh, well, luckily we're very blessed in that my parents um, are, are watch our kids and they get it um, because they did it um, when they were running the company. And so we have an awesome team behind us that allows us to do that. But yeah, we're probably um, going to do mostly local stuff together this season. Uh, he's going to put his crew in training. I'm not going to get to nationals this year. So he's going to be sailing with his, his crew to get, get ready for that. Um, but then I'll get to get on board. <laughs> yeah. Just a buddy of mine. We're training. We're going to start sailing together. So hopefully I'm not over early four out of seven races. Sherry, <laughs> uh, yeah. you have a 2003 Adams cup victory. Who's the skipper when you two guys race or is it, does it go back and forth? Tyler and I, Oh no, it's him. He's, he's, he's much better on the helm and I'm, uh, I'm much better in the front and we, we, we do much better when everybody just stays where they're best. <laughs> I'll, throw, I'll throw the spinnaker over the bow. I will every like, at, at least once a regatta. So this is really the only option. But we um we work pretty well together. He lets me you know call call some tactics now and then and get my head out of the boat. And so it's she it's a lot of fun me. sailing together. She lets me make some decisions too. <laughs> I could not race with my better half because I'm sure she would get on the go boat with a gun. So I. I <laughs> I don't it's want to die. Easy. It's not always pretty, pretty. We can't claim to be perfect at it, but we do well. We do well. Uh, we just, you know, we don't always get along. We're not always happy. <laughs> you guys won the ride. Congratulations. Great. I wish we were talking to each other. It'd be a lot more enjoyable, but we sail well. So that's good. Well, and we love each other at least a day later, at most a day later. <laughs> well, listen, thank you for your time. We look forward to seeing a Crescent uh, about a week and a half. And, uh, Hopefully, we will get a chance to spend a couple minutes talking. Yeah, absolutely. Look forward to seeing you there, Greg. Thank you so much. Again, thank you to Tyler and Carrie Andrews for uh, coming aboard and spending a little bit of time with us to talk about Flying Scott, the sailboat, their passion for a sport we all love. They'll be in town on June 11th and 12th at Crescent Sail Yacht Club for the Michigan-Ontario Flying Scott Districts, and then later in the season down at North Cape Yacht Club for uh, the Flying Scott Nationals. So it'll be kind of a fun summer for all of the Sandy Douglas designed boats because there'll be a number of Thistle Championships at Crescent and check out the schedule. You'll, we'll be hopefully with them next week. But uh, I learned a lot this week. I wanted again, thank, thanks very much to Tyler and Carrie. Looking forward to uh, spending a little time uh, enjoying a cold one. So best of luck. We'll see you next week. For all the guys in back, my name is Greg Mulman, your host. Thanks. Mm -hmm.